everyone. Welcome to our wonderful panel and welcome audience. I'm Emily Gray from Mercury Musical Developments and I'm delighted to be here. We've been hosting panel discussions with Musical Theatre Network, my colleague James who's here, um, and we were delighted when MT Pride came to us and said could we work together to run a panel discussion about LGBTQ representation in new musical theatre. So an issue that is always important, but feels particularly apt at this moment as we can stop and reflect a little bit and hopefully try to build a fairer world and sector. Um, so we will have a discussion over the next hour amongst our wonderful panel. And then um, in the last half an hour, we will open up to questions from our audience. However, you can pose your questions at any point during this discussion. And what we'd love you to do is to start with the word question in capitals in the YouTube chat. And then we can pick up those questions and we will give them to the panel um, in the last half an hour of our discussion. So I hope you enjoy this and without further ado, I shall introduce Lucy from MT Pride. Hello, um, I'm Lucy. I'm a performer, writer and producer and I'm a third of the team behind MT Pride, which is an intersectional online musical theatre festival, which aims to celebrate LGBTQ plus performers and creatives in the industry. Um, along with the wonderful Meg McGrady and Matt Powell, we've put together a series of events which explore queer pasts, presents and futures through the unmatchable art form that is musical theatre. Today's panel marks the second of our four events and you can find out more about our past events and future events at mtpride.co.uk. Uh, the entire festival is being run on a pay what you can basis just so we can make sure that all of our younger queer viewers who may not necessarily be able to afford this sort of content can access it. However, if you would like to enable us to produce more LGBTQ plus musical theatre content whilst also donating to our partner charities, which are Gendered Intelligence and UK Black Pride, there is a link in the description below the video and we'd really appreciate your support. I pass you over to the lovely James, who just has a few little bits of housekeeping to go on to before we get started. Thank you, the lovely Lucy, and happy Pride, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as Emily said, we're, we're really thrilled. So I'm James Hadley from Musical Theatre Network in partnership with MMD. We're really thrilled to be working with MT Pride on this panel. Uh, obviously, uh, now, as much as any time, we're very conscious of the importance of language when having any kind of discussion about representation. So we thought we'd start before we introduce the panelists or get them to introduce themselves. We thought we'd briefly just mention uh, some of the conversations we've been having behind the scenes about language, updating what terms we're using. We're going to be primarily using the LGBTQ plus acronym in the discussion, but we will also at times be using the term queer to, in relation to the academic queer theory studies, uh, also in relation to a specific uh, theatre company, for instance. Uh, we won't be using the term queer to refer to an individual unless they self-identify that way first. Uh, and this is because we really want to acknowledge that uh, it's a term that has a lot of history and some experience it in a negative or derogatory way, whereas others experience it as a reclaimed positive term. So as always, um, self-definition is the way to go with all labels. Uh, and we try and avoid using umbrella terms as much as possible. We're, we're hoping for the discussion to be as intersectional as possible, which is best practice to make sure that it um, acknowledges the full diversity of all experiences under the, the rainbow flag and within our LGBTQ uh, communities, the full plurality of that. Uh, so we're looking forward to our discussion and um, I'm going to pass you back over to Lucy to begin our introductions to the panel. Fantastic. So the last thing we'd like to say is that we have also made a decision in terms of language um, to be as specific as possible when we're talking about ethnicities and races. We are going to avoid the term BAME as we feel that it centres white experience and often conflates the experience of people from all other ethnicities. Um, where it's not possible to be specific about ethnicity, we'll try and use performers or artists of colour or global majority. Um, the decision to use any of the language we use hasn't been made lightly um, and it's come as a result of discussion with our panellists and each other. But please, if you have any comments, stick them in below and we can have a lovely little chat about it. So um, firstly, we would like to introduce the wonderful Gus Gowland. So hit us, Gus. Tell us about yourself. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Gus Gowland. I'm a uh, writer of musical theatre. I write book, music and lyrics, or various combinations of those, depending on 
who I'm collaborating with. Um, my first full length show was called Pieces of String, which was on at the Mercury Theatre in Colchester in 2018. Um, uh, we had a short run there and it is about gay relationships, both in the Second World War and today, and looks at internalized homophobia and external homophobia. Um, I won the Stage Debut Award, Best Composer or Lyricist for my work on that show. Um, it was filmed for digital theatre, so you can watch it there. Or if you are uh, at university, you can get free access to that through Digital Theatre Plus. Um, so check that out. Um, and I've just completed my PhD, uh, a practice-based PhD, which looked at gay male representation in musical theatre. Um, and uh, I am interested in queer theory. Uh, and off the back of that, I'm now working on a song cycle, which is telling positive queer love stories. So that's my current project. That's me. Brilliant. Thank you, Gus. And now I'd like to invite the lovely Ricky Boodle Blair to introduce himself. Oh, if you can just turn the microphone on. Oh, do we need to... I'm nice right. to I'm there now, right? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're with us. Sorry, oh, yeah. sorry. Reverse and, <laughs> and take two. <laughs> I'm Ricky Beetle Blair and I write and direct films, theatre and music and I have a company called Team Angelica um, we make these films and we publish books and I'm passionate about how music intersects with all aspects of life and um, and I'm very passionate about musical theatre moving into the 21st century. Awesome, fantastic. So we'll pass over to the wonderful JBR next. Hi, I'm JBR and I'm a recovering performer. Um, I'm currently uh, a, a manager. I call myself a creative manager. I, I think more, more typically I'd be known as an agent. Um, I'm queer and non-binary and I'm married to a musical theatre writer. One of the first shows I ever produced was, was a review of gay musical love songs, um, Harder Than You Think. Um, I'm fascinated by um, representation and diversity in all forms in our industry, not just in musical theatre, but I'm particularly interested in musical theatre because it does seem to be one of those forms that we automatically assume is incredibly inclusive, but actually I think um, we, we may find over the course of the next hour that it's not perhaps as inclusive as, as we would like it to be. And I'm really honoured to be in the company of so many beautiful rainbow warriors here today talking about musical theatre. Here's to that. Thank you, JBR. And now I'd like to invite Amy Kemp to introduce herself. Hi, um, my name's Amy Kemp. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am from Trans Voices Company, which is a performance platform for transgender, non-binary and gender non-conforming artists and singers. Um, it kind of launched in the UK this time last year, but coming up to our one year anniversary, which is so exciting. And it's been an amazing year. We, the Trans Voices Cabaret it was first started in New York um, and we brought the brand over myself and Harrison Knights and Misha Butler, we brought it over to the UK last year and we debuted uh, Pride last year at the Other Palace Theatre. And it was a beautiful event. Um, and we really want to um, create, we always call it the TVC family. We want to create this network of trans artists that can collaborate and work together and, and really like raise those voices. Um, I'm also a lesbian and really passionate about trans allyship. And I think that's particularly prevalent right now. So I'd love to talk about that. Um, I am the only kind of cis member of the team and me and Harrison have had lots of conversations about trans allyship and, and how we do that and develop that. So yeah, I'm really passionate about that. And I've just graduated from Central. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome, thank you. Um, so next up, we've got Susie McKenna. Hello everyone. Uh, again, yeah, absolute privilege to be amongst uh, this company on the panel. Um, and uh, I'm really, really happy to be asked. So um, yeah, I'm Susan McKenna. I'm an actor, writer, director. I'm currently an associate director at Kiln Theatre. Um, I did, uh, I, I was an, an artistic director at Hackney Empire for uh, seven, eight years after a, a long association with that theatre. Um, basically mostly, uh, if you like, I suppose worse than known for the, for the pantomime there over the last 21 years. 
Um, I'm gay. I, although actually, I suppose I should identify as, I'm not really good with labels, but I, I basically I'm gay. I, I, should, I suppose I should identify as bisexual in that I have had uh, relationships with both sexes um, and uh, I'm currently married to my wife Sharon D. Clark and we've been together 21 years um, but before that yes it's relatively fluid uh, um, so um, yeah um, I feel within my work uh, I have I'm uh, I have written uh, uh, gay characters uh, I've written with the idea of creating um, characters within shows that I've done that are, are happened to be um, LGBTQ uh, or rather than the driving narrative usually. Um, but I'm work really looking forward to working on stuff that isn't like that. Um, I think it's really important. The main thing as it is with um, diversity in general, it is about who tells your story and as someone who I, I suppose, at the, you know, at the moment, particularly with my work at Kiln, when we, we work with new writing, um, that is that is something that that Indu Rubasingham and, and and the whole team feel very strongly about. Um, whoever story that is, is how it's told and who is telling that story. Um, I, I I I I give a plea that, uh, and this this is this I suppose mm, probably goes probably goes to theatre and. Film, goes to goes to film and TV, maybe more than theatre, but I think it's worth discussing. Is that why lesbians always have to be tragic? It really pisses me off. And um, you know, I think as with the token black person in the, in, a, in a show, they're probably the the first ones to be killed. Actually, it's almost the same with the other with with a lesbian, or they're in some traumatic thing just as they find happiness. I'm really bored of it. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm looking forward to discussing all all aspects of, of this really broad church. One other thing I would say is that I'm really, really interested in the work that's being done in terms of trans allyship and, 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 and where we come from. And as someone who had the unfortunate, who's old enough to remember the AIDS crisis, um, there was a time when the, the, the gay community all across the board was very fractured. And the one thing that, that brought us together at that time was the fact that we were losing our friends and and that actually something like a, a terrible virus should be bringing people together and i think actually this is a very good time against the covid situation but also in terms of where we are and moving forward as a community that that the allyship of of of, of us as one voice is very important whilst we also need to listen to the, all the voices that are in there um, but this is a time to come together because also within musical theatre, our industry, musical theatre is probably more threatened than any other piece of theatre right now. Um, so let's, let's think how positively we can move forward. That's it. Thank you very much, Susie. That's lovely. And finally, but no, by no means least, I'd like to Dr. James Lovelock to introduce himself, please. Hello, um, my name is James Lovelock. I'm from the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, I'm currently writing a book called LGBTQ Characters and Queer Representation in Temporary Musical Theatre for Matthew and Drama. Um, and the thing I'm interested in doing in this book is trying to see how we can make musical theatre a more open space for everybody, particularly in the LGBTQ plus um, community. Uh, so rather than write the book just from my own 41 year old white gay male perspective and all we've had quite a few books about white gay men. Um, what I've tried to do with this book is to interview as many people as I can um, in the musical theatre industry to find out what they think um, about um, how uh, queer representation, LGBTQ representation is working in musical theatre and at the moment I've interviewed probably over 70 people um, for that. Um, I've also been doing some investigating and trying to find musicals which tell stories that haven't been told quite as often in musical theatre. Um, I'm especially interested in intersections. I'm really interested in uh, stories about um, deaf and uh, LGBTQ people. I'm interested in stories about people who are black and LGBTQ or Asian and LGBTQ. Um, I'm interested in stories about non-binary people, trans people, bisexual identities, lesbian identities, particularly as being stories that we haven't seen quite as much. Um, I've 
just built a website very quickly because I knew I was coming on here, <laughs> um, which is www.queermusicals.com. And what I've tried to do on that website is to identify stories that have been written and more importantly, stories that are in progress at the moment uh, and hopefully to direct people to be able to listen to what's happening in those musicals and to get in touch with the, with the creators. And I think like Susie said, the things I'm interested in is who tells the stories. And I think particularly who is not at the moment being able to tell their stories stories and thinking about why that is and how we can try and change that so that we are being more representative of all of the different people uh, across the LGBTQ community um, that, that um, should be seeing themselves on stage and should be able to tell their own stories. And that's me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. There's a lot of you, aren't there? Um, so I think let's start off with something quite broad and then we can just all narrow in on the bits that interest us. So um, I think the first thing I'd like to ask is what improvements would you like to see to LGBTQ plus representation in musical theatre? I think I think Susie hit it on the head earlier. It's like we are not a trope. We are not a plot point. We are we are nuanced and individual and characterful. And our, our our stories do not. My life does not revolve around my identity as as non-binary or queer. I don't go to the local shop and say, "Hi, can I get a loaf of bread and some milk?" By the way, I'm non-binary queer and I'm married, and and, and I, I'm not miserable most of the time. I mean, a lot of the time I am. I'd like to, I'd like, and James Lovelock and I were talking this morning uh, about a very specific trope um, from musicals from the 80s and 90s of, of the very camp gay man who is just there or the sassy gay man who comes in and, and lights up the room and gives advice and then dies or then vanishes. And we don't have to be part of somebody else's story. And I think this is where I, I, I fall down a little bit on talking about diversity and representation because I'd, I'd rather talk more about centrality, about placing our stories center to the narrative um, and then for those stories to not be issue-based. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll come in then. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you, JBR, and I think you're right. It is, it is about shifting the focus. And as you say, it does it always have to be issue based. It's very hard because, obviously, if you're seen as uh, a minority in some way, <clears throat> that people will assume that whatever story you tell about that uh, minority, or however one wants to discuss it, different groups, different whether that's race, whether that's gender, whether whatever that is that in some way <clears throat> each story always has to have that issue with it. And actually what's interesting is if you work with young people and you're asking them to create work, um, the worst thing you can do is say, create a piece about Black Lives Matter. The, yeah, they'll do it, but actually just telling their story or telling a story, because that was probably deep in their souls and deep in their minds at the time, that will come through and, and that comes through anyway, but that doesn't mean to say that theatre shouldn't have a political voice and a political arm as well. So, but I think there's a balance, like anything else, there's a balance. I think the improvement is about what gatekeepers can do to bring writers in more, a variety of writers into the fold, which is, I think, a cry across the industry right now anyway. Uh, having a very interesting conversation about a very famous soap who turned around and, and this was more about um, racial equality, but I think the same thing happens a lot in 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 other other stories and other things, where people say, "Well, of course we're not, we're obviously not racist, or we're obviously not sort of oh, we're totally for the for queer people, for, totally for these stories." And and then actually, you know, I don't do anything about it or put or never put them at the forefront of their storylines, and that's sort of really what you're saying, JBR. Really, I guess. And do you think it's just about the writing of shows or do you think it also comes down to things like casting decisions? Like there's been a lot of speak in like recent years about whether it's appropriate for queer characters to be played by non-queer performers and especially trans characters being mm. consistently portrayed by cis artists. So do we think it's just about writing or do we think that casting decisions and also production decisions and things like that have more of a part to play as well? I think it's also like about acknowledging that those people have barriers to accessing those positions anyway because of discrimination because of homophobia because of transphobia because of racism so those barriers make it really hard to 
if you are LGBT, sometimes it makes it really hard to see yourself in those positions as a writer or a director because it's about representation. So actually, it's really important that we start championing and giving up and, and providing opportunities and, and opening up opportunities to those people specific to that identity and that role because they, they've already got the barriers anyway. So it's about acknowledging that how, I think it's about acknowledging how, how important representation is, but not just in the, the physical show, but also as a director or as a writer, you know, if, if you're writing a, a, an LGBT story or writing a trans story, you should have trans people, not just as consultation, but within that process, not just, as, again, not just as a side thing that you bring in, as something you, you see the importance of really genuinely. And it's like the interesting, me and Harry have a lot of conversations about, um, he consults on a lot of uh, trans narrative stories and, um, or isn't the consultant, but it's brought onto a project and there's a lot of emotional labor involved in that. So it's a big conversation around how we have those discussions and how we pay for those in their own right. But I think it's making sure the representation is embedded within process is so important in every aspect and every role. Well, the big issue really is of course, um, who the gatekeepers are and so the i mean musical theater obviously it's the it's the one of the most highly represented but high, highly has the highest representation of lgbtq people out of the whole industry so i work in film i work in television work in theater and musical theater that's the room where you walk in and everybody's gay <laughs> and um it's just again and again but it's a particular kind of gay person and also the um, and then them themselves feeling that they have the permission to tell our stories and in all their variety because um, systemic um, homophobia is such that people I I mentor a lot of artists a lot of performers and they're consistently told by gay agents to not be out and um, and we often shame each other for being self indulgent. And, um, and so on and so forth. So, and then with that on top of that, then we create little clubs ourselves. And so you have a little club of white gay men who then don't cast and trans people in their work. And the, it goes on and on and on and on and on. So really we have a lot of work to do ourselves because this is not a straight white male only medium. It's... So I, I think it's really about um, working to hire one another. We have to do exactly what straight people do and make a little mafia where we hire each other. And that's what we have to do. And that's um, been a big thing. And also mentor one another because um, um, trans people aren't going to get great representation until they're making material. And so we have to encourage and, and support one another to make new material, I think. And what's, that's one thing I would say here is that um, the material um, actually some of this material we're talking about does exist and one of the things that I would really encourage people to do is to look for this material and, and find this material and get behind it and support it and so these these this material is coming up in all sorts of different places now it's not just going through the fringe theatres or through the um, through the kind of competitions anymore it's it's starting to exist and be put in places we can find it i think particularly youtube has been a great place for people and soundcloud have been great places for people to kind of promote their work um i'd like to kind of um i, I, I spoke to the writer of a musical called bad queers yesterday um which has representation across the whole lgbtq plus spectrum uh, is written by a non-gender binary writer and is fabulous and it exists on YouTube and you can hear the demos and you can see the process of it being written. And I think the more things like that that we can find and make ourselves aware of, uh, there's a musical called Interstate, which has just happened uh, in Minneapolis, um, uh, which is about a non-gender binary and lesbian um, uh, two characters at the centre who are from... Uh, I'll get it right way around, from East Asia. And it's about the impact of a trans boy seeing a trans man performing and the trans boy is South Asian. And, and that, that it's not particularly 
uh, integral to the plot that, about the ethnicity, but it is because they're on stage where there have not been people on stage very often before. And I think it is always political when we see LGBTQ people, black people, Asian people, whatever it is, it's always political when we're on stage because people are not used to seeing us there. And it's our job as those people who are, whether we are supporters or allies or part of the community or writers or audience or whatever it is, to find these stories and get behind them so that we have got more chance of more people um seeing themselves and and understanding more about different people i think i yeah. think i think ricky really hit it when when he was talking about the gatekeepers because i think there is a problem in how particularly musical theater in how it looks in that i have and i i'm looking around at all the beautiful people on this zoom and i'm thinking i have never seen love stories on stage with people that look like this, with people that look like ordinary people. I remember going to a, a stage school, one of, the, one of the more prestigious stage schools a, a few years ago and seeing a product, I won't name the production, but I said to my assistant, oh, I really like that lad. And he said, well, which one? The, the six foot muscular blonde or the six foot muscular blonde or the six foot muscular blonde? And there, there is very, very much a particular look that the gatekeepers, if you want to go there, are, are putting on stage to represent other people. And I talk more and more to, to graduates who feel that they need to ad adapt and change and become that look in order to get work. I think there's a big problem with who we allow on the stages as well, not just who we, who we allow to tell the stories, but how we then present those stories because the stories are out there, but I've, I've never seen two men on the stage kissing that, that did not look like Abercrombie and Fitch models. A nice segue, Gus. Could, uh, you were taking off your microphone before. Did you have a, a point? Uh, yes. Yeah. No. I was just. I mean, I concur with everything that's being said. Um, but I think just going back to what James was saying about all of the amazing work that is out there, um, and there there is a problem with gatekeepers not producing this work uh, on the biggest stages. And work doesn't have to be on the biggest stages. Often the best work is not made on the biggest stages. We all know that. Um, but obviously the bigger audience you can get, um, visibility is possibility. And so the more people that can see that this work exists, and as James says, YouTube and the internet is a brilliant tool for that. And musical theatre fans are some of the most ardent supporters out there. Um, and we need them to shout loudly for these stories so that the people that have the purse strings um, are willing to put their money behind them. I know with Pieces of String and that Pieces of String has, it's about gay men and that gay men are out of all of the LGBTQ plus community are the ones that have representation, um, whatever you think of the quality of that representation, but, but we have it in musical theater to some extent. Um, and, and I was consistently coming up against um, stubbornness from, from people within the industry that it was too gay, that there were too many gay characters because there were four gay male characters. And it's like, if there was two, maybe, but, um, and so, and that's coming from my position of privilege as a gay man, a gay white man. So we need the people, the fans, the supporters of musical theater to find that work, to shout loudly about it. Um, so that the people with the purse strings start listening, I think. Fantastic. So I think if we're all happy to, if we just jump in with the next question. I think we've all hit that one quite nicely. Um, so sort of in, in the vein of how we encourage more representation, how would we encourage more LGBTQ plus creatives to get into musical theatre in the first place? So whether that's writing courses or drama school or through agencies? What can we do to make LGBTQ representation even wider in our industry? Well, it's about all of it, isn't it? It's about, it's, you've got to go across the board. We have to kind of examine everything and infiltrate everything and, um, and encourage people. Um, and because people go where they know they're welcome and they know where, and you know, we go where we think other people like us have been, where role models have been, we're, we're all very passionate about that. So for instance, I don't think there's ever been 
a musical in the West End that was written by a black British person. Or maybe I've got that wrong, but I, I, I can't think of any. If there is, there's one. Um, so I've made that a mission to, to do that myself, but we're gonna need more than me, right? So we're gonna need loads and loads of people to create stuff so that people go, oh, this can be done. This Because they listen to the music, of course, and just think well, that there's no place for my voice in this. It's musical theatre has a very particular sound of that whole sounding like you're in a sometime show kind of thing that everyone does. And the um, and it's great, but, you know, um, that's why Dizzy Rascal isn't thinking, I think I'll write a musical, you know. And uh, so it's about broadening those voices and, and, and then it's all right across, you know, who choreographs and who and and who directs and who designs and the list just goes on and on and on because I you hear such horror stories from people you just performers at the fittings and saying the way they treated our bodies I can't go through that again but that but that is equally as you're saying Ricky that's about us doing work from within the community as well is it not because actually because actually that that representation is often. I, I mean, speaking as a, a when I was a younger act, actress, um, and, and and I still find as a director now, I still have those battles about performers feeling comfortable in what they're wearing, comfortable in who, 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 who what 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 image is being put on top of them in order for them to be on stage. And I have to say, my worst experience has usually been gay gay men <laughs> trying to force something onto me um because i didn't look like you know i do have tits you know and actually some designs are difficult when you've got tits so so you know that the, the, there is a dialogue absolutely it's about everything else isn't it it's about inclusivity it's about this is our chance as well in this terrible time to move forward and insist on more better conversations in some way and to into and insist that that people are more at the table and also that those difficult conversations when it comes to uh, representation particularly I think of, particularly I think of 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 any any sort of diverse uh, story and, and diverse person that that actually it's 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 the collective it's the ensemble that are telling that story not not just the writer not just you know it's it's the the the, the onus is on all of us to make sure that story is told as, as, as well as possible and that is just about how who you get on board and who the team is and looking after each other yeah <laughs> yeah I think you said something really great Susie about like telling a story collectively and really touching on things like ensemble and I think it's about acknowledging that the industry is a hierarchical structure um and education routes university drama school are very very prestigious uh privileged organizations that have a history of being very heteronormative and very gendered and very white um, and it's really looking at the actual structure of our education institutions how people access those training courses um, how routes into the industry you always hear that oh it's who you know well you know if <laughs> that's it, it itself is a very privileged position and it's acknowledging that some people might they might look at a drama school and go I cannot see myself going there. I have lots of friends who went for auditions and who are so wonderful and so talented, but would not were not considered because of their build, because of their identity, because of that they like you said earlier, they didn't fit that um, six foot tall blonde that model kind of stereotype. And actually, really looking at those education structures and breaking them down about how we can create a like collab, we can genuinely engender collaboration in those spaces rather than just I'm going to train or I'm doing this course to just recognizing like how important collaboration is, is in those moments and I think once we deconstruct that and start to work at it which is a big task because it's so ingrained you know we live in the world and the world is very heteronormative and very gendered so we're, we're really up against the world in that respect but it is about starting those conversations and starting with little small changes I guess. And I think there's something really dangerous about the the sort of mantra, the myth that that lives around the performing arts so that like, if you want it enough, you'll get it. And it's like, it's, you've got to work hard enough. And I just think that's, that disregards any sort of systemic obstruction that people feel. And it's sort of like, no, if you're, if you're good enough, you'll get it. And if you fight hard enough, you'll get it because that's how the industry works. And it's absolutely not how the industry works. The industry works on privilege. 
And so I think being able to dismantle that and, and making sure that we don't continue pushing that agenda on, on particularly performers coming through is really important because it's never through a lack of desire, you know, even though people are told often that that's why they're not succeeding. I think um, Ricky talked earlier about the sound and, and who, who we get to do it. I, I, I kind of quite like grime. And I was, I was talking to a grime artist and, and rapper not long ago, and he said, the key to making it, to being a success is to build your base wide. And if you build wide before you can go high. And I think that that's what I try and do with my agency. I try to encur encourage all of my clients to see that performing is just one strand of what they can do as a creative in this industry. And if they are willing to, to get out of that idea that if you are not 100% focused on getting to the West End, you will never make it. And if they can start to build their base wider and try writing, try directing, and have the bravery and the courage to step away from that, I'm so focused on my goal. I call it getting into the woods, getting lost in the woods. It's where the more interesting stuff happens. Little Red Riding Hood is not a warning, it's an encouragement, because that is where you, you blossom and, and you develop. And I think if we can encourage young, uh, young performers to see themselves as young creatives, and to, to explore and to build their base wide instead of this, this focus. And it's so easy. And it's easy for me to say this as an agent because this is the way you do it. You get somebody into a, a leading role in the West End and, and you leave them there for a year and the money comes in, you don't have to worry about it. It is very, very rarely interesting for the creative to do that. Um, it is very, I, I often say, they get to the top of that particular mountain and they look around and they go, oh, is this it? And, and you can't blame the mountain for climbing it and discovering that the view is not what you expected. You just have to go and climb another mountain and then another mountain. And I think agents need to, to get out of this idea that it's West End or die or Broadway or die. And we need to encourage our clients to be getting out into regional theater, into fringe theater, into workshops, getting away from the West End, getting away from that very, very commercial job that you can stay in for two or three years and pay your mortgage we need to actually encourage people to be much more adventurous and take many more risks and as an agent that's terrifying because you know a, a three-week run of something doesn't bring in enough money it's, it's but I have found in my experience that it is in the long run much better for the creative um, if they are encouraged to do that and I, I look around and, and, and I think of Susie, who I know has done so many things. And Ricky, my God, Ricky, I've admired you for so many years. And I've met you a couple of times and you've been so inspiring. But you are people that do so many different things. That is the kind, you have the kind of career that I think we should be encouraging young creatives to, to work towards rather than seeing themselves solely as performers and working solely on one road that's gonna lead them to West End glory or stardom. They should be doing what you are doing and exploring all aspects and facets of their creativity. And that I think is how we change the voices and how we change the sound and how in a generation we can change the gatekeepers. Well, I couldn't agree more obviously. And the thing you know, <laughs> really that, um, that it, it's, it's get, it, getting people to shift from looking for work to providing work for others. And that's something that um, with my mentoring, I've tried to do a lot of like, you can provide this for yourself and provide it for others. Because um, otherwise, it, you know, I've seen generations come and go waiting for some fairy godmother that's just not coming. Or good, good person. <laughs> I think, oh, Ricky, uh, uh, JBR, you're, you're absolutely, it's, it's the nail on the head. I do think it's, I think as well that, um, as we come out of this crisis, theatre will look different, and there, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot to be said that that the the idea of what you were saying, Jimmy, of of of, of, of being cre seeing oneself as a creative whole and trying. I know it's easier said than done for some people, and don't get me wrong, I'm not just saying oh, wave a magic wand to write a play. It's not that, but it's actually seeing yourself differently and understanding that actually you know, um, actually being creative in a different way, whether that's actually inspiring 50 young, 50 young uh, performers who've 
50 young kids who are, who've, who are bedroom artists who are writing their raps in their bedroom who are thinking about their plays in the in the classroom or whatever and not and, and or just to themselves because they're too embarrassed to tell anybody but actually getting groups like that together and creating shows with them informed my work so much it changed who I am it changed how I saw things it changed how I saw the world and actually that that was you know that was long that, that started sort of relatively early in my career but also I encouraged those those young artists at Hackney particularly that as they were as they were developing as artists that they actually also gave back and that there were ways of them to mentor the the the, the pit that the people coming through and I think drama schools need to rethink I think there's 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 massive problems with that as someone who didn't go to drama school I can't say it's the easiest road but it was a road that I took um and I had I found I, I had to reinvent myself constantly um, I had to do that. I had no choice because I needed to eat. Um, and also because I had ambition to, to want to do other things. I never, ever had an ambition to run a theatre. And I virtually had to almost, well, yeah, gave up my performing career in order to do that when I had no choice but to take it on. Um, that was a totally, you know, mad scenario that happened. I don't regret it. But at the same time, I do know how, how much a part of me got lost to that um, in the best way and also not in a great way. Um, so I think, yeah, I think absolutely right. It is about rethinking who you are. If you're angry and if you want to change things, there are there are by being more creative and working with others and and lifting other people up, you can find ways through this. We can find ways of changing this, changing the gate, like you were saying, JBR, changing the gate keepers as, as as we can. And now is our time to challenge the Arts Council. It's time to challenge. Having said that. We've also got the problem, and I was on a, a different Zoom meeting the other day, uh, which was looking at uh, diversity and representation overall, but also saying, you know, people aren't going to want to take risk. So we have to be seen. The work that comes out has to be seen that it's not risky. And like, you know, Gus, you were saying, people saying to you, it's got four gay characters, it's too risky. You know, for God's sake, it's a beautiful story. That's what it is. And it doesn't, it, it it's a human story and it doesn't you know and it, it is about how one packages things and it's it doesn't become niche and it doesn't become uh you know almost ghetto land you know that's been happening for too long with black theater you know that's been happening too long with 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 things that that, that the scene as niche it's like no come on now and i think um yeah there are battles to be had still but it's also about you know, bringing people to account now as we move forward and being at the table and, and talking about the future. Thanks, Absolutely. Awesome. If I can pick up on that. Sorry, we'll hand over to you, James, for a moment and then I'll jump on that. What were yes. you going to say? Sorry, yeah, I, I think there's also a thing about us um, not being scared about how musical theatre might change when we involve different people. Um, and particularly, I wanted to kind of highlight um, some of the some of the things again that I've I've picked up over the last few years. But um, there was a wonderful musical on at the Lyric Hammersmith called "Leave to Remain," um, which was um, uh, written co-written by Kelly um, Okereke. And the change, the difference in the way that that musical worked, there was a lot of choreography in that musical, and it was a very clear story about an interracial relationship. And it, it was, you know, and it was different to what you would expect. It was certainly different from the sound of a musical that you would expect. Um, there was um, Chiara Scuro, which was on at the Bush Theatre, uh, which is a, a play by Jackie Kay from years and years ago, which um, was adapted. And then Shallow Cope got involved as a composer. And that changed how that, that changed. I, to me, that was a musical but some people would say it as a play with songs and it, th these kind of things. There's also a thing that I think about when I, I'm thinking about some of my deaf uh, friends and some of the deaf people that I've interviewed, and they talk about this concept called deaf gain. What do you gain when um, a deaf performer performs a musical theatre song? And if you want to answer that question, I'd really um, recommend looking at Josh Castell work um, in the US uh, who interprets musical theatre songs amongst loads of other things um, and what you gain by somebody in, um, communicating a musical theatre song in ASL and it totally changes our experience and I think there's a thing as well about queer gain or LGBTQ gain that we might want to explore and what what is it that people that we add to these stories when we're telling them uh, and I think that's something that's really interesting to explore as well. 
Absolutely. I mean, that that's very much an answer to a question I was just going to ask the wider panel, but just to put this in there, we've had this from the, the chat as well, uh, that we're often hearing from directors saying that they may have directed a revival of a very successful Broadway musical that just happens to have, say, some gay protagonists. And some people are saying, oh, but it is only of a niche appeal. We know that there is still a lot of thinking around the, the perceived uh, restrictions on, on how commercial a project is, purely because it has LGBTQ protagonists. Uh, and we've already addressed this to some degree. Uh, and I think what James just said is very much in relation to one of the solutions to that, thinking about uh, through different lenses, what the benefits are to the richness. It's sort of the creative case for diversity in a way, some of that thinking. Uh, but I wondered if, if anyone else on the panel has any thoughts about how do we combat some of those sort of the marketing gatekeepers, if you like, the, the sense that that there is uh, automatically a limitation on who your audience will be or the commercial viability because of uh, the, the, the lead drive to a narrative or the protagonist being from an LGBTQ identity. We know that the specific becomes the universal. Any ideas on, on how we make this case more widely or, or other approaches to that? Well, that's a bigger problem at the West End level, but I mean, LGBTQ people are form a huge part of the musical audience, to put it mildly. Um, so the, it, 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 it's, it's for us to communicate with one another. But because, I mean, I, I agree that this is, is a difficult time, but I actually, I think it's an amazing time um, that now everybody's stuck at home. Judy Dench isn't working either. No <laughs> one. And so um, it's a great time to, to really rethink how we do things and come out of here um, you know, come out of this cocoon as butterflies, I think. And um, because for me, it was, I don't want it to go back to how it was before COVID anyway, it was shit. And, uh, and people were being treated badly. And, um, and the, uh, and I have a constant scream of crying artists coming to me saying, I'm, I'm not valued in the world. So something's wrong out there. And um, so for me, w w this is a great time to like we're doing now, which is fantastic, communicate and start instigating work and start creating it and start sharing it. Because yes, if Judy Dench drops a, a video tomorrow, it's gonna to get a lot of views, but, we're, but we're, it's a much um, flatter playing field right now. Everybody's at home and everybody, so you know, we should be creating and we should be making stuff and we should be fermenting, fermenting revolution right now. This is the best time ever. I, I, I totally agree, Ricky. I think it's a time to change, to a massive change to take place. I, I also think there's also the, a, a bit just to add to, to what JBR was saying about artists viewing them. Oh, oh it looks like. Uh, oh, it's back. 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 <laughs> it, was, it was actually, it was actually Sharon going, uh, where are you? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but basically, um, what, what I think is as well is it's about, you know, the pieces that you're writing. And I'd be interested to know from Gus, actually, you know, um, and, and I found it, I, I found it as well with, with the show of mine called Oranges and Elephants. So I didn't write, but, um, but I was directing it. And, and, and what I, what, what, what we came up against was, you know, how do you sell it? How do you, you know, it's niche. It's, and bearing in mind, as Ricky said, that, you know, massive part of our audience is, is, is LGBTQ, you know, what for God's sake, if you look at the figures, but it's also about, I think, elevating ourselves that, 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 that it's, it's a story, it's a story. And it might have some, some LGBT politics in it. It might just have them, that person as a, as the chief protagonist, it doesn't. And, it, and actually, I think as people are writing, I think, and, and I get a lot of people pitching things to me. And sometimes, you know, I do say, okay, let's think about audience or let's think about how shifting how you're selling it to shifting that so that it, it that everybody might come it's not about watering down or changing the piece that's the different that's different you know that's like rather students being told they need to lighten their skin oh, sorry hey, you're um, back with us. sorry yeah uh, you know i think um it it, it I, I think i just think in general it's, it's it's we can be proactive on this and we can insist that these stories our mainstream, it, because we we shouldn't just be putting ourselves in a box that we, in some way, we need to find a, a, a wider audience for our stories. Our stories are about humanity and tell a story, so there's equally people going to see that. 
well, whether they're gay, straight, or whether they're a goat in a pretty color, they will still enjoy it, or they will still come away with something. Um, and so there's ways of thinking about that. And, and, you know, that's not about, that's certainly not me saying, you know, think about just selling it before you're writing it. It's not that, but it, it, there is a, there is, there needs to be a, I, I, I think the onus on artists as to, uh, to, to think about their audiences is, is as important sometimes, yeah. Yeah. particularly because those arguments are gonna happen. I mean, we have to be realistic. We're asking people to come and see it. So I, I do a yeah. lot of workshops on, um, on pitching and um and so you know what's this what you know what's the mission and and um and what's the purpose behind this and a lot of people really haven't thought about that and then who's this for why is this important they don't want to think about that they say it's for everybody which is a way of saying that um, that my specific audience that i want to get to isn't important enough and actually it is important and I really take inspiration from from actually from people like grime artists who are, who are absolutely willing to talk about their postcode, the actual street they live on. They're not willing, they don't have to compromise at all. They're, you know, they're doing shout outs to their friends' names and all these things. And their records sell and people go and see them. People are fascinated by them. Their specific, our, our specific stories are universal. So our LGBTQ stories are universal because we are human beings and we should be as specific as we want in them and then just start with our core audience and then just be fierce. I mean, we don't have to be fierce as well. I yeah, think the thing it's gonna about, be good. <laughs> I think the thing about grime there, Ricky, is, is so important because it is, it's, it's so specific to, to, to a street, to a postcode, to, to the, the people- to the people that were in your house this morning. I mean, the chap that I was talking to, he, he I said, well, how do you write? And he said, I'll eat a, a tub of ice cream and write about that ice cream. And yet they find their audience or their audience finds them. And I think that is something that musical theatre doesn't trust. We do not trust that. And I think, again, it comes back to reminding creatives that essentially what we are before all of the drama schools got involved, before all of the big five companies got involved, before all of the gloss of marketing and all of that and all of the big theatres, before all of that, we are storytellers. That is what we do. Simple as that, we are storytellers. And I think if we can bring creatives back to believing that they are a storyteller, then we can open up for them how they tell those stories. Grime artists do not need huge budgets behind them to go out and find their audience. Their audiences are coming to them. Right. The idea that musical theatre can only be sold if it's got somebody from Girls Aloud or the Spice Girls in it, or it comes attached with a name. Um, James and I were talking this morning about the slogan for Mamma Mia. You already know you're going to love it. I mean, shoot me now. I mean, just take away all risk and all, you know, all sort of invention and, and creativity from it and just go because you already know you're going to love it. We need to remind creatives that they are storytellers and stories can be told in so many ways. But I mean, the, the big lesson is that we have to mentor people for a long time to get them to that level where they can understand yeah. that and deliver that work. It's years, the people I've mentored like Lynette Linton or Noah Clark, it was years of, of mentoring. It wasn't oh, right one thing and off we go. You have to stay with people and they have to learn and learn and learn until they're, they, until they're teaching you. And so a, a big part of our job, I think, is to mentor each other and mentor um, the up and, uh, up and coming emerging artists and commit to that for a long haul because that's how we're gonna get the great work. I mean, I, someone like Stephen Sondheim had, a lot, had years of mentorship for the great composers. And so we have to do the same thing. Yeah, I, awesome. Sorry, go on, Amy. I was going to say, because I'm just coming out of drum school now, so I'm stepping into an industry, having trained and kind of going, well, how do I navigate, especially in this weird COVID situation? And I think, uh, like, JRB, what you, you said the word, like, risk. And I think that is a really... And when we have these conversations, that word often comes up quite a lot. And it came up a lot when I was training at Central. And I think it's... It's a really, it's really difficult when we think about marketing and and if if a company is going to take on your work or, or 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 work with you, they kind of evaluate the risk. And actually, I think we need to like reimagine this concept of risk and why we see things as a risk because actually, that's that comes down to all of those internalized things that we have viewing something as a risk because 
it's not mainstream or we've not seen it before and actually realizing that that it's not it's not like it's, it's within society like equally to others but I, I I do find this concept of risk really interesting and, and what marketing companies and production companies will and will not do and whether it's worth their time and money will it bring in a niche audience if it's worth the risk and actually it's it's actually not a risk it's just something internal that we have against representing something that's different to straight white male that and that's what it is it's not it's not a risk but I I'm really interested in having conversations about how we reimagine this concept of risk and how we talk about it. Well, I think, sorry, um, sorry, sorry, Ricky. Uh, no, I, I was just going to sort of bring you in, into this, actually, Ricky, was, was really saying, I don't know how many times you've had to fight for uh, um, something. I, 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 I will, I, uh, there was, you know, there's, a, there's a, a very famous dame that I work with that, 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 you know, I can't tell you what the battle was <clears throat> in order to, to, to have him and look 21 years later what that meant. What that means now and 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 it, it is about being brave enough to fight your corner and be prepared to walk away i think that's really important i've had to do that um and that's scary and you know and i've done it in in other areas and and sometimes you just do have to you know when it comes to that risk is risk, risk is relative you also i think have a responsibility as a creative to understand you know where that budget is and where that budget's going and actually, the more the more included in the conversation about that that, that you are, the better. There's no point going, oh well, I'm just you know, I let them do that, and then I, I I know how much I've got to work with. And no, actually, have those have those conversations um, in terms of how the money spent. Particularly, you don't always get invited in, but sometimes you have to break down the door and and talk about that because then actually that way by being involved in the conversation, you can also reassure. Your, your neck on the and go this will sell if you this and it's whether listen to that's easy. um well, I, I think we're we're losing some that, of your sound you, you, there Susie, you do have sorry. to fight that corner at the end of the yeah i, I well the bit Great. i heard i love um, you do have to fight your corner this bit when you said you know we, that's why i'm so passionate about teaching people how to pitch because they're going to have to if, we're, if you're going into a commercial medium you have to understand that it's mm. that and then you have to be able to speak that language whilst not losing your own language but i mean most people who are, we're talking about are coming up and emerging and they are supposed to be wild and take risks they're not trying to get um, coach passes in you know from dallas to come and see what they're doing they're um they're they're, they're doing the three week runs of edgy stuff and killing it at Edinburgh and stuff. And they should be as wild and brave and exciting as theatre is supposed to be. This is so boring. I have to make my friends nudge me all the time to keep me awake. That shouldn't be happening. I love it. Why am I falling asleep? So it's about about encouraging them actually to be wild and crazy and um, and but learn how to, to get back to an audience, all of it at the same time. Mm. That's so great audience. to hear. That's Sorry, so Amy. great to hear. No, I that's just we, great. We we've got expand. quite a few. Sorry, I was going to say we've got quite a few questions for the audience. We we'll have to move to shortly. So if we just go to, I know there's a point James wanted to make before, and then JBR, and I don't know if there's anyone else that wanted to raise a point and get a chance to put it into the conversation. So James first, and then JBR, and anyone else wants to jump in, and then Lucy and I will put across some questions from the audience. So James. Well, actually, Ricky has just said it far better than I could, so you can really pass on that one. <laughs> okay, cool. So JBR. I just wanted to say that I think we have to expand the definition of emerging as well, because people are still, it, because the gatekeepers are still holding on to their, 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 their pinnacle at the top of this mountain, people are still emerging at age 50, 55. And I think we need to really encourage people to be, exactly, I mean, we need to encourage people to be consistently emerging. That is what taking a risk is. It is emerging into something new. Ricky, summer days, when was that at Stratford? Oh, uh, was on my own. Summer in London. Summer in London. And yes. um, that, that was emerging in, in many, many ways. Um, and, you know, you are not a, a nubile young 20 something. Um, we need, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, we need to see we need to see that people 
are always emerging and, and we, yes. the money does not need to simply be aimed at emerging between 20 and 30 and oh. then that's it, you've emerged because we are seeing that people have still not emerged at 40, have still not emerged at 50. And that is because there is nowhere for them to emerge to. Instead of going up, they are building wide, they are going sideways and they need to, we, in order to stop the talent drain, we need to open up this definition of emerging so that we are constantly emerging like a flower. 100. Yeah, yeah completely. And I think just, just to carry on from that, um, it's about mentorship, as people have said, like Ricky and the work you do with Team Angelica, are so important to allow people to develop and get better and try new things rather than doing one thing and everything being so product-led and not just product-led, led, but, but how that product is commercially, financially received. I think particularly in musical theatre, the you might have a, some success with something, but the the people looking after you saying, what, what are you going to do next? Like, I like your voice. Tell us what you can do next. There's not enough of that. It's about, you did this thing. Great, that's your show. And it's making sure that we let people find out what their voices are and try different things and keep having, it's allowing them that risk with the mentorship um, is so important, I think. I would just, I think all of, I, absolutely all of that. I, I would say just in terms of what we're talking about, um, Ricky, you were talking about changing the gatekeepers and, 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 and we're saying we're in, it, we're in it for the long haul. But one of the things that I, 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 I think we need to express as well, that, that try and get on a board, you know, it, there, there are boards, it's, it, there are, it's all stinks, some of it, in terms of who can be allowed on, who can't. There are bigger conversations to have about who sits on boards, particularly of publicly funded buildings. Um, you know, I don't think you can tell someone how to run their company if they're not getting public money, but I do think that they have a, uh, you know, a responsibility. But certainly if it's public funded, that, that, that boards need to be looked at. And that that is a way that you change gate, gate, gatekeepers. And it is also a way that you, you, you allow a theatre to go with a risk. You know, if, you, if your board is supporting you and you're prepared as an AD to take that risk and the board supports you, because they're the right people on that board uh, who, who get where you're going, then then you can actually you know do things. But if a board turns around to you and goes, it's too risky, and da, 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 no matter how much you thump the table, <clears throat> sometimes that won't happen. Um, and I think that's about representation on the boards. Thank you, Susie. So we've got uh, entering into the last half hour of the discussion. So just to turn over to some of the very good questions, some of our viewers live have been sending in. Firstly, so a question to everyone on the panel this is coming from Nathan in the audience. As a bisexual gender fluid person, there's an innate fear of having to dilute parts of my identity to break more into the industry. Have any of you had this fear and how do I overcome it? Who would like to respond? I would. I would. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I wanted to be a writer. I was born in 1961. I wanted to be a writer from 1964 when I started to read. And, um, and I wanted, and I spent the, the rest of my life doing that, putting on shows. And there's a thousand messages, particularly when I started, there were so many messages saying, you're too black, you're too gay, you're too working class, you can't do it from where you are, and all of that. And, um, and the thing I learned in my uh, ongoing journey is that I, everything I needed, I already had from the very beginning and I shouldn't have watered down anything. I shouldn't have restricted anything. I shouldn't have limited anything. I should have been 100% trusting of who I was and what my vision was, who I was as an audience member and a creative. And I should have been, um, I should have been as unfettered as a child when I was doing it. And, uh, and, and because it only goes well when I do that. And so they shouldn't be afraid to, um, afraid of, you know, if, if you're not gonna get a situation where everybody loves you, that's just not gonna happen. But if they don't love you, you'll survive. If you don't love you, you won't. So the most important thing is that you have to be, trust yourself and respect yourself as an audience member and give yourself the theatre that you've dreamed of and that you paid money to see. That's brilliant, thank you. I think, I think it, it's authenticity 
and, and I, I, I think that's scary, um, particularly when you are 20 something and you've just graduated and you've spent three years being told, this is what you must do in order to get 98% in acting and 62% in acting through song. And, and drama schools need to change. That's, I, I'm adamant about that. Drama schools need to change. The, the idea of grading people by percentage, the, the idea that people need to, to find their brand that is, is just repugnant to me. I use it a lot myself because it's shorthand, but I will always couch it by saying oh, that branding is actually looking at the marketplace and working out how to fit into the marketplace. So you're already constricting yourself when you're talking about your brand. You have to be brave enough to find your authenticity and run towards that. Um, I interviewed Jenna Russell a few years ago and she said, um, some, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but she said, if you are five foot two and dumpy and you cannot belt up to like that and your, you, your leg doesn't go up here, that's who you are. Embrace it. Somebody's going to buy it. If what you are selling is authentic, somebody's going to want to buy it. But trusting in that authenticity, I appreciate because I am 47 and it has taken me a very long time to discover my own authenticity and to trust in it and to run towards it. So trusting in it at 20 and saying to people, just be yourself in an industry where everybody looks. One of my clients once said to me, I, I felt in that audition as if I was a Nokia in a room of iPhones. And it broke my heart, but I understood exactly what they meant, that we, we tell you to be yourself, just be yourself. And then we put you into a situation where everybody is a type. And that is how we work in the industry. We still work in those types and in those categories. Um, the only thing really to do is, is, is as Ricky said, no one, you, you're not going to be loved by everybody. I'm not loved by everybody. I'm hated by so many people. And that's okay. You know, um, Mark Shenton once said to me, you just get, have to get on with everybody. You know, you're going to be going to the same parties and the same first nights as people for the rest of your life. There's no point in making enemies. They'll like you or they won't like you. And, and you just have to like yourself. And I've taken that with me. Um, find your authenticity and run towards it. I also think that without doubt, when you're first starting off in the business, it's important to say yes to things so that you at least know what you don't want to do. Or if there's a platform that you don't want to, you can leave from that platform. You can say, well, I tried it and actually I had a shit time. Now I'm not going to stick in and try and change that platform if it's not for me. If I know who I am, if I know myself well enough. Um, but if you're young and you're trying to get into the business, then, you know, you could sit a long time trying to find the right job that might actually fit your identity or however you want to be. That doesn't mean to say you have to, you have to change who you are, but you can certainly decide, well, actually, you know, um, maybe this platform isn't for me, or maybe, maybe I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've got this job or maybe I want to go for it and I want to meet this, this casting director and I want to meet this director, uh, but I know I'm not right for it, but I'm going to go, but I'm going to present my true self and then let's see what happens. I think, it is about knowing yourself and that's hard that's hard to do when you're in your early 20s and you certainly don't discover anything you know i didn't write anything until i was 30 so you know i think it's 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 hard but at the same time it's got to be true to yourself otherwise you will spend a lot of your career not doing what you want to do and, and awesome. i think it's, Thank you. no go ahead gus i was just going to say I, I think it's really interesting that um there's a real trope in musical theatre of the authentic lead character whose whole journey is about becoming who true to them, being true to themselves and becoming who they should be. And it's sort of a, like a cruel irony that that is <laughs> so prevalent on our stages and yet so difficult to do in real life. And also it's about being authentic in a musical in that certain way rather than a real life way. Awesome, thank you so much. So um, the next question we've had is from Copper Sparrow and they've said, what are your thoughts on blind casting or the argument that the best person should get the role when it comes to LGBTQ plus representation? So should queer roles always be um, always be played by members of our community or is it okay either way and we should just cast blind? I, I wanna pick up on this idea that the best person ever gets the job. Um, casting is done by committee, 
particularly musical theater. And anyone that has been in the final of a West End musical will back this up. You walk in and there are 32 people on that panel and every single one of them has an opinion on who the best person for the job is. It never, there is no one best person for the job. Casting is done by committee. So the idea that the best person should be cast, it's just rubbish. It's a fallacy that we need to get rid of straight away. Casting is a decision. And at some point you can make a decision about that. You can say, I want this role to be played by a black person. I want this role to be played by an East Asian person. And that representation is more important to me than whether they are the best singer in the room or whether they are the best dancer in the room. You can make the decisions about representation at any point during the process, which is why when you get these, these shows that are all white casts and they say, well, it was just how it worked out. No, it isn't. That was a decision that was a conscious decision made by a group of people that they were going to sacrifice representation in one form in order to have a better singer or a better dancer or a better actor in another form or a better look for it. It's not a decision that. that we make. It's not even that that they're choosing, that they're going, oh, well, we're gonna, we're going to go differently on the on the demographics because this is the best singer. You only have to watch. I mean, I, it's my idea of hell, but you only have to watch the X Factors to see that the best singer does not get through to the end. Everyone's seen that. That's nonsense. And the um and people, you know, it, you can't say that. Oh, well, the best person got the job, and um, when they all look the same, as if there's no good black singers anywhere or you know I mean that's it's nonsense and um, so there's always been uh, there's always been um, positive discrimination at work in this industry it's just been positively discriminating towards look must, must look and feel they want to be comfortable in the green room so they want someone who looks exactly like them I think one of the other problems is as well is that you're not allowed to ask I don't think you're not allowed to ask in the casting room about the sexuality or the gender of the person that you are casting. There are ways around that, of course, because a lot of people are openly gay, lesbian, bisexual, whatever it is on, uh, on social media. Um, but I think it does make a big difference. I mean, I was looking into this. Most of the time when I see any musical that has same-sex protagonists and particularly same-sex male protagonists, um, there is... Um, often one actor who is cast is gay and one actor who is cast is straight or very straight acting. And I feel like that must come from the prejudice of the people that are casting those musicals. Um, and that, that we have this thing that when you see a gay couple, one, and it's still this thing, one has to be masculine and one has to be feminine. And until we challenge that in the casting room, that's what's going to keep happening. Having said that, when I have seen musicals where the two protagonists are cast with gay actors, um, and I think I can say this about the or openly queer actors or bisexual ca- uh, actors. And I think I can say this because they're both open about this, but The View Upstairs is a good example of this. And it, as a audience, I can tell. I can tell when you've cast a straight man in a gay role. And, and, and it does make a difference. And I think it's something that casting need to think about how we can actually get into the stage where you can be make the decision to cast a gay actor in a gay role because at the moment I don't see how you're allowed to do that with the restrictions that there are in the casting rooms. Do you think that has something to do with the idea that sort of gay relationships are acceptable providing they um, comply by he- like heteronormative mm. standards? Do you think Absolutely. that's part of the issue? Like gay, gay couples fine, but you must have one who's more manly, one who's more, more, of, a, like, more of a woman and they must get married and have kids and a dog. Like, do you think that plays a large part in those casting decisions as well? And do you think when we do things like gender swap or roles, so like, for example, the company that recently happened, does that constitute representation? Or are we actually just shoving a little bit of queer baiting in there to appease our queer audience members without actually writing genuine, authentic queer stories? I'm quite happy to be appeased. <laughs> Um, so if that's why you're doing it, fine. Just as long as you're doing it, and the uh, but but I mean it is really tricky because I, actually I can't always tell. Uh, I th- I like to think of I I've got great gaydar, but I don't. And um, and I, I have made a career, you know a, a lifetime's uh, career really out of trying to promote um, LGBTQ artists and push them forward. But the fact is. 
that um, sometimes um, I've cast people who were straight when I cast them and were gay when they did it. And uh, because th there's so many discomfort, so much discomfort that they're having to hide. And then when they're around people that, um, that, are, uh, that, they, that make them feel comfortable, then they come out. So I, as much as I really want to super promote, um, you know, I did a whole show where everybody was trans and, and so on and so forth. I'm really, it's a big thing for me, but I, I actually don't believe I can, otherwise I can only cast out gay people. It's not about gay people, it's out gay people is what we're talking about. And, uh, and so, and, and I've cast people and I've been on a wonderful journey and I've become like really powerful activists. So I'm a bit hesitant about this conversation that even though it's important and I've seen all the prejudice of the, if I cast a gay and it's, it's not so much this butch femme thing you're talking about. Cause I think everyone just wants everybody to be straight acting and everything anyway. But the um, but I have done projects where because I write for my actors where I've I've, I've um, cast straight actors and gay actors together and agents gay agents usually uh, love the straight acting uh, character the actor and hate like despise the um, any any femme behaviour or butch behaviour from a from a someone who was assigned female at birth. There's a whole kind of um, self hatred thing that we go through. So it's so much more complicated than the than the conversation than 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 the simple thing of just cast um, straight people. I've seen all of that, but at the same time, there's so, there's so much more um, to someone than are you gay or are you straight? You can have the part because they they their their sexuality isn't one thing or the other. I totally agree, Ricky. I totally agree with that. I'm very uncomfortable. With 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 it being blanket, I think that the I think there's also a lot of responsibility on the director to to you know it's not about asking people whether they're straight or gay or whether however what your radar or gaydar is or whatever. But if you can have a sensibility and you can decide you as a director or as a, a casting director, you can decide who you put in front of people. You can decide who you want to see. You can also go out and find people. You know, it's not good enough to sit on a panel and go. Uh, well, the casting director just showed me this. So that's how, you know, uh, actually get out to the theatre, get out yeah. and see other things, get out of the West Deck, go and see stuff that's that's out there, you know, um, and, 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 and see if we can bring a new energy and a new pool into that casting, into those casting decisions. So, um, and I don't necessarily think that, that, that it's, it's, it's absolutely imperative, you know, because if you say it's absolutely imperative for someone to play a gay character, where does it stop uh, altogether? And I think it's, much, as Ricky was saying, it's much more complicated than that. Not that I don't champion that, not that I would cool. find a responsibility. But it's not as simple as that. And also we get so caught up in complaining that we stop mm -hmm. celebrating. So last year, everyone was talking about this issue really passionately. And Ben, ben Wishaw, me meanwhile, went out and won a Golden Globe and uh, an Emmy Award for playing a gay character. And no one celebrated it. No one said, this is fantastic. This is amazing, he's done it. No one said that. And so, so everything we're arguing for, he is actually doing. And, mm -hmm. then, and so really we're just complaining as opposed, to, as opposed to really trying to sort it out and also creating an environment where people feel safe. I did a whole interview with somebody saying why they're not, um, why they're not more out gay performers a gay journalist. And then uh, I explained, well, I'm out. And he went, he meant more famous and more masculine looking people. That's what he was talking about. And then we moved on to Rock Hudson somehow. And he said, I can't take Rock Hudson seriously. I see him in those music, in those movies with J Doris Day now. And I just feel he's a queen just pretending to be straight. It's uh, uh, He just gave me all the reasons why no one comes out. So I'm more interested in creating a great atmosphere for people to be out in before just, obviously the trans issue is different. That is a different issue. And, um, but I think we, I want to, uh, to create an atmosphere where people, also I know trans actors who don't want to be out as trans actors because they can pass and they don't want to. So we, uh, then it's uh, my job, they came out to me. Now I have to make a world where they can come out to everybody. Yeah. I, I love Ricky, what you said about going on a journey. Somebody starts and you cast them and they're straight and by the end of the run, they're gay. And because I was reading uh, about the, the young artist in Jagged Little Pill, who was also in Fun Home, 
who discovered her queerness through playing a queer character. And I think if we are simply saying only gay women can play gay women, only gay men can play gay men, then we are limiting and we are, we are taking away the fluidity of sexuality. We're actually limiting that. I do think that, that trans is a very different issue and, and, and probably one we do not have time for here. Um, but I, I do think it, it's important that we, we, but we acknowledge, as you said, our own um, internalized homophobia um, a lot because a lot of that is when we are casting, when we are directing, when we are writing even, we want to write a character that is not femme, that is not this, that is not that. And that is, that's on us. And you're right, we need to create an atmosphere where you can be all colors of the rainbow, whatever you like in any moment, because that is the nuance uh, of being human. That yeah. is, you know, I, I know some extraordinarily camp straight men one who is, you know, he has built his entire career on being a dame in panto. He does Easter panto, Christmas panto, schools panto. He literally spends his entire year as a panto dame and he's straight and married um, and, and has no sort of... That's really queer in some way. <laughs> but Exactly. It's the fluidity of it that, that we could be denying, I think, if we, yes. if we are limiting it to people. No, I think it's really important to centre you know, LGBTQ artists and push them forward. That's my obsession. But I think to just make it this kind of like, uh, it's just not going to work. The um, we we because you are going to have to interrogate people in the in the um, in the audition room or somehow get their agent to kind of tell you and and then I think we scare people off. I think just to be clear, what I'm what I'm. What I'm noticing is, and I agree with everything that people are saying, I think what I'm noticing is that the default at the moment is, as we said, these kind of very almost normative couples when we're casting a couple. And I don't think... Uh, I want to hear what you're saying, James. What's happening? We answer necessarily, as we say, you don't answer necessarily. Oh, I don't believe this. Sorry, James, <laughs> we're losing your, your audio on that. Um, do you want to try just now. to pause a moment and yeah, try it again. Sorry, if you reverse about a minute. Yeah, so I was I think I was just saying it's it's the problem is you see no, I paused again, haven't I? Oh, you're right. <laughs> Audio's okay. Okay. Yeah, the, the problem is is where that we at the moment are just getting very sort of masculine, feminine, butch thing going on or make a normative things and I don't think the answer is that you have to ask people but I think we have to be aware that at the moment the default in the casting room is that we that is what we are getting on stage and that is something that we need to find a way to Absolutely. Just want to check if anyone else wants to say anything on the call in terms of trans casting, because I may want to make sure if there is any other comments, Meg. I can I can definitely speak on it a bit. As a like as a trans, as a trans person, a trans writer, a trans performer. Um, I think it's and I've been in the room with conversations with people who have with big companies who have cast straight seeming or like cis seeming people. Um as trans characters. And I think it's incredibly important that we open up the conversation to that, that we challenge people when these things happen. Because the idea is that when we see cis men in the roles of trans cat females, it's furthering the ideology that trans women are just men in dresses. And that's why trans casting is so important that it is authentic, because it is combating a narrative that has been pushed by TERFs, by people who are transphobic. And that is why it's important that we make sure that we have the correct gender presentation with trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming characters, because we need to push the ideology in a way still, because we're still, we have so far to go with trans rights that we basically need to push the ideology that these people aren't playing pretend, that they are genuine humans with genuine life experiences. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> Yeah. We need, we need I, more trans directors, I think. Mm, yeah, I would agree. Um, and just coming off Meg's point, because we've been in the room quite a lot together over these past year, Meg, haven't we? And doing kind of TVC stuff and just did a little kind of showcase at start of the year now. But 
I think it's all about that space that you're creating as well and how you're how you're engaging a, a room and, and what kind of atmosphere you are creating and really setting a precedent of it's those I mean there's there's big overarching things but small things like acknowledgement of pronouns acknowledgement of uh, a zero tolerance space for homophobia transphobia racism and and and, and encouraging encouraging I guess it comes back to that collaboration but if you're collaborating with a company and working with trans performers making sure that's a really equal playing field and making sure everybody feels like they can bring what they feel they can bring to the room but there's no obligation to do that like I know for a fact that the show we worked on in January um there were some very very out trans performers but also some that weren't out and and that was equally held within the space and we acknowledged that and it wasn't about um trying to force anyone to do anything or to have conversations they didn't want to have it was about creating a space where people could feel they could do their work and they could do it without fear um and I think that's so so important when we look at casting and we look at running a rehearsal room and I've been blessed to be in the most gorgeous rehearsal rooms with the most beautiful trans creatives who are my bestest friends now and who have taught me so much and just yeah creating a really safe space that you can be free to take risks and be yourself is so important um yeah fabulous thank you so much um so we're going to finish with one last quick fire question from the audience have a quick think what is your favorite instance of lgbtq plus representation in musical theater this could be a moment a character a narrative just hit us up let's end on a lovely positive note I'm going to talk about my own show. I <laughs> love that. Do it. Um, in Pieces of String, there's a quartet called Standing in the Shadows where the four gay male characters are singing at the same time. And the whole song is about them grappling with their internalised homophobia and trying to understand it and trying to dismantle it. Um, all done through the form of a show tune. Um, and just because I was able, I was so proud of writing these four uh, gay male characters singing about their sexuality together on stage. And the song ends in the way it was staged, it ends triumphantly with two of the characters kissing. Um, and the re reaction to that song was so overwhelming every night. And um, people were applauding the song because of the moment but people were applauding two men kissing and like really applauding and, um, and it felt like quietly political and um, I'm incredibly proud of that moment specifically. I, I'm, it, it's a problematic moment, but actually it's a, it's a moment that I didn't realize was problematic until much year, until years later. But it's one of, one of the first films that I really fell in love with, which was Victor Victoria. And I was, I was tiny, I was, you know, really, really small. And the moment where he kisses her and she says, I'm not a man. And he says, I don't care. That I found as a, as a child, the most erotic thing um, imaginable that this butch, butch, butch man kisses Julie Andrews and says, I don't care. I, it, it doesn't matter to me whether you're a man or a woman. Of course, later, you kind of, you, when you've watched the film 300 times, you realise that actually he does know at that point. So it kind of negates it. But that, that's something that I still remember. It's, it's still such an incredible moment for me. Um, I'll say next. Um, uh, I guess I, I'm a, I, I think... Um, I think there's probably earlier ones than this, but one of the thing that really stuck with me, I was in, wow, I don't know. It was the first production of La Cage and Fall, and it was literally George Hearn singing I am what I am and taking his wig off at the end in that triumphant way. Um, it spoke a lot to me uh, as, as, a, as a person um, and as someone who's, who, who was still sort of going, well, I don't know where I stand, where I, <laughs> where I stand sexually. I know what I like, I know what I don't like, but I don't know. I, I, I found it really, it was powerful. And, and no matter what people think of that, that show or, or, or whatever, that moment of defiance, that moment of, of, of politicizing in a, with a small P of standing up for who you are was incredibly powerful. Um, uh, and I'll, a very other quick one was actually happened in one of 
my pan titles where I, I had two uh, d two characters, two straight characters, and, and who fall in love by accident, and they they and and it's two guys, and they thought that they, because they get in the way of a spell, and and it was amazing how many how the audience at the end wanted them to stay together, <laughs> they wanted them to be together. And they knew what they'd started the show as and where they were going at the end. And the kids were, were really behind the fact that they decided to stay together. You know, um, yeah, I was proud of that too. But I think, yeah, George Hearn taking his wig off. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think for me, there were, there's the thing that I really love is um, I went back to university quite late. I was about 32 and I joined the LGBTQ association there. And it was the first time that I felt like there was a group and it wasn't just me on my own. And there's two moments from musicals that I've listened to recently. Uh, there's the song, The Louder We Get, which is from a musical called um, The Louder We Get, which was also called Prom Queen when it was over here last year, uh, where all of the students are behind this one student who wants to take his boyfriend to the prom. And that moment for me was really important. And then the other one is this musical I was talking about earlier, Bad Queers. There's a song in it called Hold On. And it's that thing about resilience and how we help each other through some of the really difficult times that we have as LGBTQ people. And those, those two moments for me are moments that really moved me, I think. Ricky or Amy? Uh, okay. Um, the first character that I saw that looked queer in a musical to me was problematic. And it was anybody's in West Side Story. Um, who was clearly to me as a small kid seeing the film on TV, that's the that's that's definitely the gender rebel. They're fighting for their position, which is incredibly moving to me to to see. And of course, the time it was done, they couldn't do what they would do with that character now. I think, um, but to me, it was you know because you're looking for those important moments, and I think they were trying to, in their in their very clumsy way, I mean, calling. Them anybody's, for instance, wasn't great, but the um, but really important. But for me, it's, it is the moments that I'm trying to. Uh, I, I have to say, uh, uh, like Gus and Susie, it's the moments I'm creating that have been so important. And doing a show which was not a musical, but was music based bashment that I did at Theatre Royal Stratford East, which was like a roller coaster of taking an audience from being uh, vocally and loudly homophobic to, through a whole journey of of. of gay love stories and to the end when I the two two of the main characters who are both uh, male uh, dance together and they grind together and they do a dutty wine as they say and um, and hearing that audience every single night go from cheering when someone was beaten up to the point where they dance with their lover and standing up and cheering them for dancing with their lover was just uh, something that I couldn't miss a single show so I could just see that moment again and again. <laughs> and it taught me how much what, combining music and truth can take an audience literally out of their own bodies and out of their own minds into a new um, adventure. Um, I've been trying to rack my brain, but, and it's not, it's not a direct kind of queer um, representation, but, Glinda and Alphaba in Wicked for me was like and, and I and I know there's a massive following for this so forgive me but th their romance because I, I as, as, as I watched that as a young girl I could not see it any other way and it was such a for me it's a, this beautiful love story that's not really talked about because she goes off with a man um, absolutely gutted with that ending but <laughs> it's it, it was there was something really queer about it and like and, and for, for years and years and years I couldn't work it out and I was like why do I feel so drawn to it particularly Adina and Kristen and them originating those roles which I just was obsessed with um, but that for me was like an amazing sort of like just this incredible representation and this 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 really true friendship which had this this real genuine love in it um that was amazing for me and I think I watched I came out when I was like 12 um I had great support but my teacher gave me rent to watch which while there are some problematic elements of that as well I think a lot of our first representation memories are a little bit problematic but I I loved Maureen and Joanne I thought it was fiery and exciting and, and and it was kind of celebratory and fun um 
and I was like I want to be Maureen but I'm so Joanne and now I'm like yeah I'm Joanne and it, it, it was those moments for me of like oh this is I can see parts of myself and love um and luckily for our final show at uni we got to uh, devise our own piece um we didn't do a musical piece but it was had music within it and um I got to perform in that and one of the lines was I'm not scared about being visibly queer which we took from the, the show was all about lesbian identity and and the cyclical nature of its representation it's how it's very sexualized and censored but there's a quote from the Camden bus attack and one of the girls uh, which happened and one of the girls says I'm not scared about being visibly queer if anything you should do it more and I got to um shout that line over and over again and to, to perform that and to think back on all that representation I had was so empowering. And I think I just, I feel very, very lucky to, to be queer and to be part of this amazing LGBT community and be like, to see all of the kind of representation we've got and have so many mentors and people to look, look to who've paved the way. Um, but yeah, definitely Glinda and Alphaba. What, what, a, what, a, what a power couple, yes, <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> That's brilliant pride sentiments. Before we've got to wrap up now, but very, very briefly, if any of our three MMT Pride producers have their favourite moment of representation, do you want to jump in very briefly, any of the three of you? Oh yeah, I can yeah, I definitely have a couple. Um I think my I have kind of like three, but they all stem from the same thing of the idea of queerness or transness not for following a trope, whether that be I got to see uh, Robinson Moyster Silva's wonderful piece, Works of Art, which is um, about uh, two brothers, but one of them just happens to be trans. Um, and the whole show follows just these two brothers. And it's only really brought up a couple of times, but just to see a trans person living without trauma, I think that was very important. Um, I also would say like the first half of falsetto is just seeing queer characters who can be problematic, who can be human. I think, and have other problems outside of their queerness, like their family. And I find that incredibly important as well. And then Fun Home as well, which is about, while it's about a woman who's coming out as queer, it's also about family as well, about dealing with queerness within the family and queerness as su suicide and all of that. And it's just wonderful. I cried so much of it. <laughs> Um, for me, along a similar vein, I think it's Ring of Keys from Fun Home. I don't know if it was just really amazing timing when I first heard it, but the week that I realised I was queer, I heard that song for the first time and it just really hit me. And I was hideously in love with a girl who wore dungarees and wore her little Dot Martins. And it just, it hit home for me. And now whenever I hear it, it just feels like such a wonderful celebration of sort of naive innocence and just like pure queer joy. And I love it. It makes me happy whenever I hear it. I'll quickly throw mine in. Um, I remember being 14 and watching a bootleg of Spring Awakening and Hanshin Relo seducing Ernst made me suddenly realise um, it became slightly different uh, life and all of that. Um, and many other things, including some gorgeous new work that is emerging. I got to watch one yesterday um, called Unicorn. And it moved me to absolute tears. And I think I'm excited to actually see some of the stages and spaces that are moving forward as time goes on. Brilliant. And segueing from that, so on those, all those wonderful, joyful sharings of, of amazing representation of the LBGQ, another note of hope, when we went out last year to look at 320 musicals being pitched, there was fantastic representation of LBGQ voices. And we were really thrilled out of the 41 musicals that we selected, there were seven that were representative of non-binary LGBTQ um, characters and experiences, including Meg McGrady's The Phase, which is fantastic fantastic and lesbian pirates which uh, all of the the characters were disabled as well as lesbian so we're seeing, starting to see some genuine intersectionality within new british musical theater writing which is really encouraging to see so the talent is really out there and it's all about continuing those conversations to collaborate to to work with each other i have to say this has been a really wonderful uh, pride uh, experience to towards the end of the month oh to do a shout out before i finish as well my uh, favorite representation in recent years would be Benjamin Till's Brass, which has a beautiful uh, love duet in it as well, not to miss that out. So it remains just to remind you all that there is a pay what you can link underneath where you're watching this on YouTube. Please do think about supporting the charities and the 
creatives of MT Pride. And finally, to thank our wonderful panel for sharing your expertise and your time. It really means so much to all of us. Thank you so much for being part of our Pride. Thank you.